Welcome to VPO Global Webinar brought to you by Digital Ship. We are your hosts, Vaid and Carl, together with our guest, engine design and development company, WinDG. WinDG has a great story to tell. They managed to reduce methane slip by up to 50% without compromising on performance, which makes LNG-fueled vessels more viable in the future. So both of our speakers today are from WinDG. I'm happy to have Volkmar Galke, Global Director of Sales, and Dominic Schneider, Vice President of Research and Development, who will soon will tell what their technology offers to shipping companies. We are happy to cooperate with WinDG, who is also sponsoring this uh, webinar. Uh, my colleague Carl, who is the founding editor of Digital Ship, will make sure that we have a meaningful discussion today. And during the presentations, all attendees, you can ask questions, which we will address after the presentations. So Carl, please lead us into the topic. Okay, thank you, Vida. So, um, so it's a win, win GD, not win DG, but... Uh... So we've got two two separate audiences which we're bringing together here. We, we've got some of you have come through our vessel performance optimization newsletter, and some people have come from Digital Ship. So I'll just try and explain very quickly what the relevance is to uh, to both of you. So I think if you if you're coming from the the vessel performance optimization side, you probably know about the drive to push ships to run or on, on gas power because it's a uh, lower CO2 emissions and all this effort we're making to get more efficiency out of the engines. And you've probably heard that. Uh, there's concerns about gas which slips out and burned out the engines, which we call methane slip. That's got potential to mess up the whole story of gas fueled ships because methane is a much stronger greenhouse gas than CO2. So we're really trying to cut down on the methane slip. Um, you might not be aware, I, I think this has really, really moved quite a lot in the last year or so. Just as an example, I've got a quote from Katrine Vetereng, who's the business director of tankers with DNVGL. So she said last week, all tanker owners considering a new building today are considering LNG fuel, which I, I was quite stunned by. Um, we're going to talk about dual fuel today because we've got engines that run on both gas, which is LNG and diesel, because of concerns we can't get LNG everywhere. Now, we've got some people watching who know us from, from digital ship, so you're interested in digital technologies in shipping. So there's also a fantastic digital technology story here. And it's really about getting much more control out of the engine so we can use it much more efficiently. So I've got a very basic illustration of what, what control means. Our office here is just around the corner from Arsenal Stadium and the coach Arsene Wenger is famous for being very controlled over the food that the footballers eat. So the, the footballers would be more effective. So that's a very basic illustration of what control means by engine. So, um, WinGD has the best-selling dual fuel low-speed engine in the maritime market since the second half of 2017. They're not an engine manufacturer, but they're an engine licensing company. And uh, they're going to talk about a new engine design they've got, how we can help handle methane slip and uh, use digital technology to improve efficiency. So I'd like to welcome, um, first of all, we have Volkmar Galka, who's a director of sales with WinGD, who's, uh, who's going to give the opening talk. I'd like to welcome Volkmar. Thank you. Thank you. Just give me a sec, sorry. So I share my screen. Oops. Everybody can see the slide now? Yeah, there it is. Perfect, okay. So yeah, thank you very much for, for having us here in, um, in this forum and um, um, thanks for the introduction. Very, very well spoken. Um, of course, um, a, a, a dual fuel engine and in the marine industry, uh, digital is one thing, but also we have uh, still some hardware to install into a, a vessel to propel it and to push it to the water. And uh, as you uh, um, definitely uh, mentioned, uh, Carl, that, uh, that the XDF engine is, is the best-selling engine in the market at the moment. Uh, we, have, we have on the dual fuel engines a market share of uh, roughly 70% uh, also of including uh, LNG as fuel vessel and also uh, LNG carriers. 
um, of these, if uh, we have um, 320 engines on order, XDF engines on order, and of those 320 engines, 80 are in operation. So we have a wide range of, of, of uh, applications in the field. And uh, we have approximately, I think, uh, 730,000 running hours already uh, accumulated uh, uh, with, with all these engines in the fleet. So that, uh, that gives us really a, a sound basis also to say that uh, low pressure technology is sound and is reliable and is also controllable. Uh, of course, controllable due to digitalization and also to the, the, the control systems on the engine. Electronical engines are the basis for this, but Dominic uh, can then later maybe go a bit more into detail on this one. Just uh, some remarkable uh, achievements. Um, we started 2000, uh, 20, 2011 uh, with the XDF concept uh, development. Then in the 2015, the first uh, TAT type approval test was, uh, was achieved for the first uh, low pressure dual fuel engine. And um, 2020, uh, this year, we have, um, we are very, very proud to announce this, but I mean, it's already been in the press and in, in the social media. Um, the, the maiden voyage of the, of the most powerful um, auto engine in the world. Um, the, the, the vessel is now uh, sailing from Asia to Europe, and uh, it's, it's really exciting to see this vessel with, uh, with the XDF-92 uh, in it. Um, that's one very um, uh, interesting story, but the other one is that um, the XDF, in, XDF engine is the standard choice for all the LNG carriers now. Um, in the past, it was a steam turbine and the DFDE engines, but now uh, LNG carriers equipped with two-stroke engines, the XDF engine is the standard choice. Why is that? Um, of course, it's also because of the uh, emission characteristics and of course, uh, due to the attractive capex uh, with this system, with the low pressure system. Um, just to see here, yeah, the, the graph you see here, um, it's best in class when it comes to uh, SOx and particles. Um, that's a, a very, very successful story here, especially on particles. I think it will, it will be focused uh, a bit more on particles in the future. And um, of course, the lowest NOx emissions uh, um, um, in the market. So with the LP uh, engine, the low pressure dual fuel engine, there is no um, after treatment needed uh, to comply with the tier three rules um, on NOx. Um, however, um, with this concept, we are we are not resting. Uh, we have we have uh, still. Uh, done the tremendous efforts to uh, to develop uh, the technology further and um, that's why we're coming up with this xdf 2.0 now which is an engine concept i would say it's uh, it's new technology on top of the xdf engine to make it more competitive um, and we are as uh, as it was uh, uh, mentioned by Vida, we are we are reducing the methane slip and not on um, with a penalty on fuel consumption even with a, with a reduction of three percent in gas and 5% in liquid consumption and a reduction of 50% of uh, CH4 or methane slip. Uh, and uh, Dominic can also go a little bit more into detail on the technology on this. With this, I would say that uh, the, the LNG is, um, is, is preparing um, uh, the, the, the way for other uh, alternative fuels in, in respect of LNG. Uh, may it be bio LNG or may it be uh, synthetic LNG, but uh, for us, the LNG uh, route is the way to go forward. Um, having said that, um, I know that um, this is not the, the only way to go. Um, we know already that uh, the targets um, are quite ambitious, uh, the IMO targets in 2050, and uh, you cannot or we will not, or the industry will not achieve this target by just switching from from one um, fossil fuel to the other. Uh, LNG is, from my point of view, or from our point of view, the bridging fuel is not the silver bullet. Um, there will be all uh, other technologies and fuels to come into the picture. You see here the, uh, the final, we, what I just uh, said a little bit uh, before is that we have, of course, the EDI phase one and two, it's quite clear. Um, then the LNG as fuel, as I elaborated, um, and then we have the design parameters, hull equipment efficiency, and it's part of uh, phase three, um, which is also obvious. And then we're coming to system integration, hybridization. That's maybe the focus here on digital ship. 
Um, we will also uh, uh, have a little um, uh, mentioning here on on how we how we do this. We have uh, the engine digitalized. Uh, we have, of course, digital simulation tools uh, to to develop the combustion process. For example, we have um, a, a clear uh, strategy forward on our uh, digital tools for um, the uh, training. Of, of the crew, um, digital tools for for uh, communication with the engine and the vessel in terms of remote monitoring. And of course, a big, big subject here is hybridization. And in hybridization, I see the biggest potential here uh, that the engine room will be a more complex, a more complex system. And we as VGD, we are the experts in propulsion and energy management in the engine room. So there we, we widen our spectrum to also combine, let's say, PTO, PTI, um, battery capacities and, and the gen sets, maybe also in the direction of uh, looking into new technologies for gen sets and um, combine this all with other energy sources and, uh, and create an energy management system here um, in, on a hybrid basis. So that moves also direction of smart shipping. What I mentioned before already with the with the uh, digital tools on uh, uh, remote monitoring. For example, we have a tool called White WinGD Integrated Digital Experts, where we monitor the engine, not only monitoring the engine, but where we also um, see the performance of the engine. We analyze the engine, and we can of course then give recommendations uh, to optimize the engine uh, during the aging process. And of course, we can also see um, the components aging. So we can uh, go into the direction of condition-based maintenance. And of course, uh, to uh, move on later on, if there is any issues uh, to solve the issues uh, remotely from, from our experts in winter tour in Switzerland. Or even then a step further, that that will be my dream to have a, a button and to drag and drop spare parts in a shopping basket with the tool so that the ship, the ship, uh, the ship crew can, can already uh, pre-order the, the spare parts uh, on the vessel. Yeah, having said that, LNG as fuel is is the bridging fuel, and um, we as engine designer, which was also uh, clearly mentioned by Carl, or an R&D company, uh, we are not here to tell the market what fuel will come. Uh, our job is to prepare the technology and the provided technology to digest the fuel to come. And uh, we call it X fuels. Um, very nicely goes along with the XDF engine. And uh, from my point of view, um, the, the the XDF engine here is is the right concept to uh, to go further. And it's a safe and it's a safe investment in a in a flexible asset. Uh, why is that? Uh, because we have we have two processes in one engine. We have the auto process in the engine and we have the diesel process in one engine. So that means this engine is optimized for gaseous fuels and will be optimized for liquid liquid fuels to, to be injected into, into the engine. So that means the XDF engine is a very good basis for, of course, now LNG, but any X fuel to come. And I see that X fuels to come in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the future, in the next years, maybe first as a drop in. Uh, into LNG or into diesel um, or into any kind of liquid fuel. And then later on, it may take over completely. We see that here in this graph, for example, uh, what I said that um, LNG is a, is a bridging fuel and you see the real, the real uh, increase of LNG. Hopefully you can see my mouse, but if not, doesn't matter. It's this light blue, blue uh, area. So that LNG has a, has a, Really, really strong growing, growing, uh, growing trend, and of course there's other fuels uh, to come as well. Um, here in this graph, it's very detailed. I uh, borrowed it from DNVGL, um, and uh, here you see that ammonia is also available fuel for the future. As I said, we don't know exactly which one will come, but uh, definitely LNG is the right, uh, the right decision now at the moment um, uh, to to invest in. On the parallel side, there is another forum. In New York now discussing on ship owners, and I just heard a comment that uh, the, uh, the 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 infrastructure is not available, and I think that's a bit too short-sighted because the LNG bunkering infrastructure is growing. Uh, there was latest the announcement of a bunker vessel with 18,000 cubic meter capacity. There's a booming market on LNG and bunker bunkering vessels, 
I think the infrastructure issue will be solved pretty, pretty soon. So the summary here for that slide is LNG is the way forward uh, today and for the next, uh, let's say, one or two um, engine uh, generations. And of course, LNG is the best uh, uh, technology, a dual fuel technology for other fuels to come. And then what I said before, especially with the auto and diesel cycle in one engine, um, really the, 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 the basis of this engine is flexible. So uh, for, the, for the auto cycle, we would say it's optimized for gaseous fuels. And uh, with the diesel cycle, we are optimizing um, for, for the liquid fuels. And um, we are not resting, as I mentioned before, we're pushing the boundaries and uh, we're pushing the boundaries in, in, in development. Uh, we have already announced on the CMA conference that we will have another technology being um, developed, uh, VCR we call it, uh, for um, more optimized, um, for op more optimized uh, consumption uh, figures in, in liquid mode for the, uh, for the, for the XDF engines. Uh, we're further developing other technologies to uh, reduce the emissions and the uh, fuel consumption also on the gaseous side. So there's not an end at the moment. We still continuing there. And um, yeah, these new futures, um, the new features, sorry, the new features, uh, they, they are under development and we will uh, when the time is right, uh, come come out uh, with those uh, with those technologies to explain to the market, and and make them available for the whole industry. So um, just to to close my 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 little introduction here, um, that um, with this uh, with this uh, XDF concept, and uh, as I mentioned in in the beginning, uh, lower capex. That's a very important issue here. And also on, on, on maintenance uh, costs, we are with a low pressure engine best in class. So having said that, low capex, optimized operational costs, uh, being flexible on gaseous and liquid fuels, I think that the XDF engine is the right technology to invest in. And with these words, I would like to hand over to Dominic. And I have learned that Maida will shut my presentation. Perfect. And uh, yeah, Dominic, please. Uh, get into a little bit more in the details of the technology and then later on we are here for you to answer questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you Volkmar, very good introduction. I will load my presentation and move on from here. Um, what uh, Volkmar nicely said is actually uh, that we face uh, some challenging times in technology and uh, it's not too clear in which way the fuel developments will go and before the industry can agree on the new fuels we will for sure see a variety of fuels and what we try to do here at WinGD is to provide the technology to uh, deal with all these fuels coming. So the XDF 2.0 is actually a step into a technology that allows, of course, an optimization of the LNG burning engine, but it's also a base for some future fuels that are discussed. Technology becomes available and we can then utilize this technology in case some other fuels appear. So what is the XDF 2.0 doing? Um, this... Dominic, I'm sorry, are you going to share some slides? Uh, are you not seeing my slides? Not, not yet, but not a problem. There is just a share screen button at the bottom. Yes, yeah, sorry. And I while forgot. you are preparing, I'm reminding the audience that uh, we are uh, waiting for your questions or to the Q&A box. It, it can be also a comment uh, if you have some views about uh, uh, hybridization or something. We would be curious to hear your feedback. So Dominic, uh, I invite you to continue. Thank you. I hope you can see the screen now. Yeah, yes. that's fine. Uh, that's always when you ask the technical guys to, to do technical work, right? Um, so XDF 2.0 fundamentally is actually um, now I'll quickly to go through the slides. Fundamentally, the ICER concept. The ICER stands for the Intelligent Control by Exhaust Recycling. So fundamentally, it is an exhaust gas recycling system. Um, it allows on the lean burning cycle to actually reduce the energy consumption. The energy consumption is the gas consumption combined with the uh, pilot fuel by 3%. 
If you run the engine in diesel mode, so in the backup mode, it's even 5%, so a higher uh, gain there in fuel consumption. Um, in gas mode, it also helps to reduce the uh, methane slip up to 50%, and it can help to increase the onboard steam production. Um, why is that the, the excess gas recirculation back to the combustion chamber actually allows to, to control the reactivity of the gas mixture. So the oxygen in the air is uh, replaced by, by excess gas, which acts as an inert gas. And therefore, by the amount of excess gas, we can actually control the combustion speed. So we can much nicer control the speed of combustion. That means we can actually balance between combustion speed and most efficient, highest efficiency. So from a thermodynamical side, this is a clear advantage. It is all uh, on a model-based combustion control. So we use actually simulation models, results also from data from the field uh, to further optimize and tune the uh, combustion control in the engine control system and continuous learn with new data available. So there is a direct link from, from physical data to the digital world, and then we optimize and um, calibrate our simulation models, which then again are used to control the physical engine. For that, we need actually a new control system that is able to handle that amount of data. So we just rolled out a brand new control system, the WISE control, WinGD Intelligent Control Electronic WISE. Um, and this is at the same time a fundamental base for the wide system just introduced by, by uh, Volkmar. So if you combine the engine with device control with the wide function, the digital expert function, it can be even uh, linked to a route and weather planning tool or a fleet management tool. And we can help actually to optimize the uh, energy management on an individual ship or on the entire fleet. So this is our aim, where, we, where we're going, and uh, piece by piece, the fundamental uh, infrastructure becomes available. Um, ISA technology, to come back on the physical engine, um, the, as I already mentioned, the ISA actually reduces the reactivity of gas and the air mixture uh, by oxygen replacing through carbon dioxide. So this, is main, this allows to achieve Sorry, again, this allows that we can actually apply higher compression ratio, which uh, of, uh, in terms re help to reduce the compression energy while having the same or increasing the expansion energy. So as a consequence, the mean effective pressure and, and therefore the uh, efficiency of the engine will increase. So with low reactivity of the gas mixture, we actually can go closer to the limits and more accurately control the combustion that allows them to, to have a higher efficiency. The ISA technology consists of a low pressure exhaust gas recirculation path uh, with the exhaust cooler. This, this, this system is very simple. It's a low pressure system in a bypass stream. Hence, it's an easy installation. It doesn't need blowers. It's uh, off-the-shelf cooling devices with all required certification. And in case of a failure, and I think this is a very important point, it can simply be bypassed. So if there is a, an issue with water cooling, a leakage or so, you simply bypass device, which is, of course, if you have a high pressure EGR solution directly on the engine, not so easy. The water would rather go directly into the engine, into the combustion chamber. Here, this risk is not existing because it's a simple bypass stream. You can see that here on this schematic drawing. Um, I also try to use the, the mouse or the laser. The exhaust gas from the receiver is going through the turbine and at the low pressure side after the turbine, there is a back pressure valve which controls the amount of excess gas flowing back through a microeconomizer that helps to produce further steam to the cascade exhaust cooler that cools down the excess gas and then back at the, the compression side into the engine. So again, if you have a failure of the ICER system here on the left side, you simply close this valve here and this valve before the compressor 
and you have no risk of any water or any contamination going into the engine, you can actually repair whatever repair needs to be done and then restart the system. Very nice, simple and easy to understand. On the water side of the ISA system, we have a circulation tank and the cooler um, that of course cools back the water because this is heated up by the excess gas. If you run in gas mode only, the risk of, of contamination is very low. Nevertheless, you can actually connect that to, to a bleeding line and uh, you could connect either to the water treatment system, but we are also convinced that you can actually discharge directly overboard search water because the contamination is so low. It needs to be monitored, however. So summarizing a bit, uh, the XDF 2.0 impact on our portfolio. Um, it's very clear at the introduction of the DF 2.0, we enter actually a new kind of a new technology age and we, we roll it out, out to the portfolio. Many projects are being uh, discussed. There's a big interest uh, on customer side already and we try to, to meet expectations with uh, making data available. The uh, general technical data are, are available now end of this month and also a lot of the, the detailed designs and the installation drawings, etc., are becoming available. Again, the technology is reducing fuel consumption uh, and emission further, and therefore adds to the sustainability of this lean burning technology. As already mentioned by Volkmar, the XDF is best in class in terms of emission. And here uh, you cannot emphasize enough the uh, levels of toxic emission like NOx and SOx. In fact, we measured NOx emissions uh, at 10% of IMO tier three level and SOx are hardly existing. And also the PM particle matters or black carbon uh, is further reduced with such technology. Um, so in terms of global warming potential, methane slip can be reduced as mentioned by 50%. And also if the IMO agrees to add the the particle, particulate matters, the PM to the carbon count. Uh, here we have a clear advantage compared to diesel cycle. And, and uh, it has to be expected sooner or later that black carbon will be added to IMO regulations. And also for global warming potential, the engine has a huge potential or the technology has a huge potential. Um, so we, we safely claim that actually the DF 2.0 is ready for the next regulation step, which is being discussed at IMO or the European Commission level. Um, we are not too afraid of these steps. We can maintain easily with the LNG burning engine already. Um, to move on, as already mentioned by Volkmar, we are, have more than 320 engines orders, 18 service, 730,000 running hours, almost all important signals, segments uh, covered. And again, the big advantage in our view is the combination of diesel and auto cycles. So we are very well prepared for future demands of future uh, technologies or fuels. We are now cur uh, currently collecting a wide experience of lean burn combustion with the various ratings, various gas qualities, all, almost all possible operation patterns and utilize the data for future technology product development. So there's a direct feedback loop into our development work from the data collected on board. And this uh, XDF technology combined with the new control system is actually the first time in history where we can make such a direct link and utilize real operation data to optimize our development cycles. So we no longer have to assume things, we have hard facts. And then this gives a, a big advantage, uh, particularly also addressing the energy management, which was mentioned by Volkmer. Um, also, thanks to such intelligence and knowledge, we were able to run the LNG cycle, the gas cycle down to 5% engine load. We have learned from our operators that if they invest in a gas engine, they want to run on gas all the time. So we've continuous optimized to achieve lowest possible loads and earliest possible transfer from diesel to gas. You know, by IGF code, the maneuvering needs to be done in diesel, but uh, the transfer is done as quick as possible so they can really operate on gas. Um, 
Another advantage of, of our um, position here is our close integration with the shipyards, ship designers, engine builders, um, the, where we can actually optimize not only the engine, but also the peripheries of the engines and therefore actually start to, to become kind of an integrator when it comes to the main engine room. So to summarize a bit the slides, the key to getting to 2050 IMO targets is actually um, industry-wide collaboration, where we also see that WinGD is uh, in a good position. We have developed the toolboxes needed, so we focus on the engine uh, primarily, and there we have uh, a particularly fuel toolbox where we actually include sequences of simulations, experiments, simulation experience of different fuels and combustion cycles, or even mixed cycles. So we can actually offer a good, a good solution there uh, on a very early stage already, uh, looking at fuel qualities, do the, the fuel analysis, uh, derive from it the, the, the combustion properties, the ignition properties, um, use our uh, spray combustion chamber, constant volume chamber with optical access to actually understand this fuel better and then use the results of such investigation in the simulation to, to come up with a theoretical study which gives which are very close to, to the reality already. Um, we do understand the complexity of the various stakeholders and, and uh, as Volkmar correctly said, we are not in a position to decide on the fuels to come, but we are in a position to provide the technology and we're confident we can meet this expectation. And once we have chosen to support one of these fuels, then of course we can also guarantee the full life cycle support, so, so said from cradle to grave. So the journey to 2050, it's very clear. It needs to, uh, all stakeholders to come together for a success. But we see WinGD as an important partner in this journey. We can provide all the, the knowledge needed for the combustion of the fuels. And we also expand our knowledge for the digital world. So we can actually use our uh, data being very close to the main consumer on board, the main engine. We can use this position to further optimize ship propulsion in a very en en energy efficient way. So that was my part of the presentation. I hand back to Wida, I guess. Yeah, no, that's no, great. Well, th th thank you very much. So um, just to encourage the audience to put questions in the Q&A box, I, I thought a sort of warm up question to start off with. Um, so this is actually the first time we've got into depth into into engines with digital ship, but you know you've given plenty of reasons why we should have been doing this. You know, I, I suppose twenty years ago propulsion was a very silo within the maritime industry, but you, you've talked about you know linking with ship performance people. You'd like to get more involved in the satellite communications and ordering spare parts, and uh, so there's lots of good reasons why more people should be get involved in this discussion. I don't know if you have any thoughts about how this reflects the sort of people you're having discussions with. Is it still just the propulsion people, or are you? Getting involved with other departments and shipping companies now. You know, Volkmar, maybe you're, as a sales manager, maybe you'd like it's a sales part, which is interesting, I think, isn't it? How, how your customers are. No, of course it is. It is, of course, yes. I mean, the um, uh, I didn't really get the, the the question you're asking here, but uh, I think you 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 you're referring to the the combination between the the propulsion and the digital transformation. Which is the way more and more people are getting involved, you know, I mean, it used to be you only understood engines if you were a propulsion specialist, but now yeah. a lot of companies have at ship performance departments we're hearing about, you know, who need to know all this stuff and uh, make making decisions and guiding the company on okay. what to do. No, no, I mean, yes, okay, now I get it, sorry. Um, no, of course, uh, ship owners and uh, ship managers, uh, they, they, somehow, they somehow also expect the, the expert of, of the propulsion uh, to move in that direction. Um, I think we are a little bit of front runner here in this respect because we have started this uh, quite early. And, um, um, you know, I mean, the, the most, uh, the most uh, reliable engine in, in, in a ship is, is a mechanical engine. Some ship owners do see that and they were really, really diff difficult to convince them that if you want to have a performance uh, the optimization and, and, and better emissions, you need to transfer from a mechanical engine to an electronical engine. And that's maybe the first step of digitalization of, a, of such an engine. And then it, it started and it really started there. And um, 
uh, we were very, very first in that uh, step. And we have also then introduced the, 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 the common rail system for injections here. And then I move further. So we started now, as Dominic mentioned, uh, with the new control system, which is uh, also heading in the direction of uh, digitalization, because we need more, we have more complex signals, more complex engine rooms, and more digital tools coming into the engine room. So also the engine needs to be integrated and, uh, and also the engine needs to deliver more functionality on a digital platform. Uh, we have uh, this, this wide system, which we discussed for the remote monitoring and, and optimization of the engine. We have um, this, uh, a, a digital tool uh, to train, to train the, the crew, because uh, as I mentioned, the, the engine room will be more complex and the more complex the engine room will be, so the, the requirements for the crew will be more, more demanding. And uh, that's always the case that, that crew needs education. And in the past, we could uh, show the, uh, the crew how to unscrew a pump or something like this and, uh, and to disassemble and assemble a part and, and, and uh, fix it. But we never could uh, simulate something. And nowadays with the digital tools, we can, we can also simulate, for example, a complete blackout. So it's dark. It's really the whole engine room is dark, and then they have to start pumping. A simul they have to simulate a, 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 a we simulate a fire in the gensets on the gensets on the on the on the on the power power supply, and then the crew has to go and pump by hand, uh, pre build pressure up, and start the emergency generator, and then start the whole engine room again until the main engine is running again. So you couldn't do that in the past. So we can really uh, build in scenarios to train the crew uh, due to the digitalization. And um, the, having, having that now somehow established, uh, not really established, but it's on the way to be established. Um, and as, as Dominic said, with all the tools there, we can nicely fit into all this digital and smart shipping uh, concept for weather routing or whatever, for optimi trim optimization and uh, logistics optimization. Uh, bunkering optimization, so that's that's all fit, fits in there, and um, also the measurement of uh, of the of the consumption, the measurement of the emissions that will all be an optimized on this. And we need a platform to handle all these signals, and uh, that's that's what we what we're developing and working on. We're introducing into the engine. Oh, okay. So we've got uh, three questions about methane slip. I guess this must be what the audience is <laughs> most yeah. interested in. We've started answering on someone typing here. Dominic, would you like to, I mean, maybe you take all of those. <laughs> yes, exactly. Like actually, to... I started to answer. <laughs> 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 Very good questions, actually. Uh, the one I already answered was well, how to measure methane slip. Uh, there are, of course, uh, special devices for that. The lab devices. They're also really actually extremely uh, expensive. The, these devices, they take part of the exhaust stream and they then analyze uh, in a spectrum analysis the different uh, matters in this exhaust. And, and methane CH4 is then defined as parts per million, so PPM. And with that knowledge and a very accurate uh, knowledge of the exhaust gas flow, volume flow, we can then translate this in grams per kilowatt hours. So this uh, results, um, that was another question now in current XDF 1.0, so the first generation, we had a methane slip averaging around two grams per kilowatt hours. And now with XDF 2.0, as mentioned, we reduced that by 50%. Yeah. So we go down to roughly one gram per kilowatt hours. Now, if you compare that with, uh, for example, medium speed four stroke engines, they're considerably higher uh, due to the higher speed. The reason we have such low methane slip is manifold. One is um, the layering of the gas mixture in the cylinder. So we have kind of a sandwich layering. There is air, then there's the gas mixture, then it's air again. So we don't not get in contact with the combustion chamber component so much. And therefore the uh, mixture is not cooling out. That helps to reduce the methane slip. Another big advantage is the uh, long stroke. There's a lot of time for the fuel to burn and uh, the slow cycle times. So again, it's the same as the long stroke. With the low speeds we're having on the slow speed engine, there's simply more uh, cycle time for the methane to burn. Um, I just go through the question quickly, Carl, if it's OK. Yes, yes. Um, can this be? Retrofitted for a running engine's time frame, um, theoretically yes. It doesn't need 
really big changes on the engine, but you need to find a way to install the system in the ship or to support the exhaust cooler in the ship. Um, we are currently looking with the, uh, an engineering partner how such a retrofit project could look like. Uh, we expect actually so the first information in the next few weeks because uh, we have received these questions several times already. Um, and, and we try to, to offer a solution here. Yeah, that's the beauty also maybe just to jump, did I jump in, sorry. Um, that's the beauty of the solution because as you, as you have seen the picture Dominic showing with the engine and the silver uh, can there, uh, it is an off-engine solution and it's quite complex because it's very, very close to the engine, but it's, a, it's an off-engine solution that that is the potential for retrofits. And um, I hope the question was going in that direction or was it more a question on how to retrofit an, a normal uh, diesel or, or maybe XDF ready engine into a DF engine. So that's also possible if that is if what was maybe meant by the question so that a, a DF ready engine can be uh, retrofitted later on to a full DF engine is of course possible. It's quite hard to make that viable, I imagine, when you've only got 10 years of vessel life, is that a... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think... the, po the point here on the engine is... Um, Sorry, the point here on the engine is, is not so important. I think that it, it's a much broader concept to, to be looked into because uh, you need to have uh, the tank and, uh, and the fuel gas supply system. So you need to have the space for it and you need to have uh, the fuel gas supply system uh, implemented. And then the conversion of the engine is just a tiny part. I say it's not tiny, but it's a, it's, it's, it's a part of it, yes, but it's not the, the big portion. The big portion is making that vessel, transferring that vessel into a gas, into a gas vessel. I think uh, the question was uh, related also like to an LNG carry where of course the situation is different. The lifetime of such a vessel is 25, 30 years and is also related to asset management to ensure yeah, yeah. With a good retrofit and upgrading of the asset that you also still get good charters, etc. Um, shall I move on on the next technical question? Yes. How much lower is the CO2? Oh, I, I assume... <laughs> I'm always a bit struggling if we talk about carbon and decarbonization because what we actually want to address is greenhouse gases, which of course is not only CO2, that could also be N2O, for example, if you look at the ammonia's fuel. Um, so the green or the global warming potential. Now, if we look at CO2 and CO2 equivalent, which would be the correct uh, expression, I would say, then uh, with the XDF, we have about a 15% reduction compared to a, a diesel MDO engine. And if we add uh, now uh, XDF 2.0 and ICER equipment with reducing the methane slip as well and, and to make the fuel or the engine more efficient, we expect or we know from the test we are between 22 and 25% reduction. So we are almost on the same level, if you look, uh, like if you would look at the high pressure DF engine, just looking at the main engine, but we do have the advantage of lower uh, parasitic loads with our low pressure technology. So a ship installation has, with the next DF 2.0 has a better CO2 footprint than one with a high pressure installation. Yeah, very, very important point, Dominic. Um, that's, that's always, um little bit gets, gets forgotten uh, that uh, you, you compare main engine with main engine, which is okay, it's absolutely fine. But um, in, in principle, you need to compare vessel emissions by vessel emissions. Um, and um, okay, for us, more important is the engine room. So we would uh, uh, really recommend to everybody uh, doing a case study, um, compare engine room by engine room. And if the main engine has a little bit higher methane emissions than the gen sets, and I've seen the figures in the in the question. I think uh, 6.4 grams per kilowatt hour. That that comes from the medium speed engines, and uh, you have to also weigh it in the correct way so that at the end, as Dominic correctly said, the footprint is equivalent. And we see that clearly um, with the with the XDF engine, which is already now in the market, that, that we somehow and the LNG carriers were similar, and. Uh, now with the XDF 2.0 with a 50% reduction, it's definitely it's definitely similar, if not better, if you compare engine room by engine room. Because for a high pressure system, you need higher power to drive all these pumps and all this equipment to pressure up the gas up to 350 bar, for example. 
uh, and we just injected with 13 to 15 bar, which is clearly an advantage. And uh, so there's much, much uh, lower power required and the gensets are not running on that, on that, uh, on that higher load there. So my, my, my wish is that uh, it's a fair comparison and we compare engine room with engine room. Yeah, okay. Do you want to try, I mean, I, I guess v Vipian is asking for regulation, which is maybe for a person yeah. for a different forum, but since he's asked you, do you want to share any views about where, where you see? Oh, yes. Tinnitus? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, come on. Yes, thanks. Yeah, a very good question as well. And of course, we have to expect uh, more stringent regulation. And, and again, the IMO's focus on, on greenhouse gas is very uh, obvious. And, and uh, not only the IMO focus, also the industry has started to move and, and many, many key players in industries are, are actually pushing towards good and sustainable environmental sustainable solutions. And yes, regulations will come. Um, now, particularly for meth and slip, there is a, a discussion ongoing on IMO level, if it should be integrated like into the EEDI, for example, mm -hmm. um, for which we are not very supportive. And, and with us, actually, most of the uh, engine OEMs and not because the OEMs don't want to have this regulation, but we think it's the wrong, the wrong approach. The EEDI is a design index. It's not really an operation index. Mm -hmm. We would appreciate much more if, for example, the SEMP, so the, the real operation consumption is used as, as a reference because that's, that's the real fact. The design index is always a bit questionable. So meth and slip or in future uh, black carbon particle matters, and that's what I mentioned before in my presentation. Also, this is being discussed at IMO level if particle matters should be part of regulation because particle matters also have a greenhouse uh, sorry, uh, a global warming potential, warming, yeah. which is not quantified really right now. The International Panel of Climate Change, the IPCC, has not yet concluded on how, how severe actually PM actually is. Um, and there the diesel cycle has a, a real issue. So we have to be quite careful with, with you know, choosing the, the one solution versus another based on, on, on uh, expected regulations. So the, the task is really to, to scope with these regulations, uh, uh, embrace it and say what we do about, and that's where we see our role. So, and we are absolutely convinced that in the long term, and all the discussions going on, that the low pressure cycle is the, the better cycle that has the better future than a high pressure cycle burning the, burning the gas fuels. And there was a connecting question to this, uh, Dominique, saying what, why, if it's not regulated now, why, why shall I invest in it? And um, yes, of course, it's an investment. Uh, this technology doesn't come for free. And uh, it's an, it's an add-on on the engine. And um, it has to be somehow been um, also been uh, financed and, and, and paid by the ship owner. But what we see, I mean, I can't say, or we can't answer that question because first of all, it's not regulated. Second, to, we are, as we said, we are an, a technology provider. Uh, and we 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 trying to put um, the market requirements into a product, and that's one of it. And uh, but we hear it, we hear it from the energy carriers. Uh, we get a clear demand from. I mean, first we discussed this, and we 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 opened our books and we talked to one of the um, the, the most famous LNG carrier community in Greece, and they all screamed and said, "Yeah, we won the first, you know." And uh, so it's it's a demand of the of the owners to move into a green. Uh, in the, into a green uh, direction or a green narrow uh, rich direction and uh, so that's that's the demand of the ship owners and i'm i see that they're willing to invest in it and um, it's a good way yeah. and uh, being prepared for the for the regulation yeah we are mute carl C carl you're muted you. Oh, my, I'm sorry. No, 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 you're on. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so there's a lot of talk about ammonia. I understand ammonia is like diesel, so you can just use that straight away. You can use LNG straight away. I don't know about methanol, if that runs like diesel, but keeping ship owners' flexibility, I suppose, that's what they really want. So they can do yeah, that with your engine. Exactly. That's, uh, yeah, I would say... Oh, sorry. Go, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. I'm, I'm just reading the questions which we see here in the Q&A, and, and uh, it's a very good question again. I mean, how is the XDF engine's readiness for future fuels? And that's exactly what we try to emphasize, you know, whatever the fuel, whether it's 
a hydrogen-based fuel, it could be ammonia, it could be methanol, it could be ethanol, it could also be a synthetic LNG. But beside hydrogen-based fuel, there are also the biomass fuel, which we cannot completely neglect. Uh, they will also come and they're more like diesel-like fuels. So the XDF fundamentally has both cycles. It can burn gas, like fuels in a pre-mixture approach or diesel cycle fuels with a diffusion cycle. So where we inject the fuel into a high compression end temperature where it's ignited by the compression instead of uh, a pilot system. Now, an LNG engine fundamentally allows already, you could already add hydrogen to the LNG right now. We could, uh, this is being done partially actually to add 5%, 6% hydrogen from renewable sources to LNG supplies. For, for example, in Germany, they do that for their uh, uh, natural gas supply in the pipelines. They add some uh, renewable hydrogen to bring down the CO2 footprint of, of the gas, natural gas consumption. Um, so this is quite okay. And another advantage of an LNG engine is actually the, the, with the cryogenic fuel LNG part of the installation is already available. So, I mean, the LNG is somewhere around minus 160 degrees Celsius. Ammonia, if you want to use it liquid, is minus 30 degrees or 30 something degrees. And so the system fundamentally is there. It needs adoption because ammonia is toxic. It has its disadvantages. You need to do something, but it's not a fundamental change of an approach. So from a fuel handling side, uh, ammonia could be adapted to, to LNG burning ships. However, the energy content of ammonia is about half of LNG, about four times less than uh, of diesel. So your volumes need to be increased. The other nice thing of ammonia, you can actually start to discuss, do I inject it liquid in a diesel cycle or am I gonna use it in gas, in a gas state? And, and their uh, investigations are still ongoing, what's better than, um, one of the properties of ammonia is that it burns very slow. So we have a slow cycle, long cycle, slow speed. I think uh, the two-stroke slow speed engine is kind of, of privileged to burn ammonia and, and ammonia is kind of privileged for, for handling and transportation. So there are the regulations in place for shipping um, and so on. So yes, um, the engine will not be the challenge, whether it's for ammonia or for methanol, which is likely to be injected like diesel, the engine will not be the challenge. We can handle that. The base research is done, it's available. If the fuels becomes available, the adaption on the product is, is a rather short term exercise. I would say one, two years, some projects uh, are already running with different fuels. So. The engine can be adapted. The bigger challenge is on the fuel handling side and particularly on the fuel availability side. The infrastructure is not in place. The investment in these renewable sources, they need to be doubled and tripled that, that uh, we have enough re renewable energy sources available in 2050 to meet the IMO demand. And, and this is not in place. So the political incentives, they need to come now. It's not a technical question, it's a political question. Yeah, it's also, I mean, the, the ammonia available today is only brown ammonia and um, you need to get it, you need to get it produced by, by renewable energies to, to make it, let's say, green. Um, and also with the other uh, uh, fuels, uh, X fuels, as we call them, uh, renewable energies have to be there. And uh, I was just doing an exercise with, um, with, with a colleague and uh, calculating what kind of, what kind of, uh, Gigawatts you need for producing um, <laughs> producing the 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 the, the ex fuels for the future and uh, just for for the fleet for the world fleet and uh, we came up with a rough estimation of two times two times the the the, the gigawatts as whole Germany on renewables to uh, to produce the fuels for um, for for the, the ex fuels for the for the shipping industry. Please uh, uh, send me your feedback if that calculation might be right or not. Uh, I'm open to correct it. And uh, but it's massive. It's massive, and we have to massively invest into these renewable energies until we until we get greenish ex uh, fuels out of it. Made ammonia, might uh, made uh, methanol. Then also methanol has a has a potential. But um, yeah, as Dominic perfectly explained, uh, we have to see, um, and and we are prepared. I also publish a magazine about carbon capture and storage. So 
you can make a uh, blue <laughs> decarbonized ammonia, but uh, nobody nobody gives it any attention anymore. It's all almost got written off. But the Norwegians have been doing it for decades, I think. It's, uh... <laughs> yeah, also in uh, uh, in in the US, uh, they they transport uh, they transport uh, gaseous CHO with trucks to uh, to Saskatchewan and uh, and put it there. And yeah, it's 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 a it's it's a process. Yeah, it's uh, and it's uh, let's say still in its in its development. But also possible, yeah. And I don't know if you. I mean, if you if you uh, capture carbon out of the air, it's uh, quite. Uh, let's say it's doable, but maybe not so efficient. But if you if you do carbon capture at the source, at the funnel, so you may be more efficient. So it could be possible, but um, I have not more in uh, insights there, unfortunately now. I'd yeah. like to give Vida a couple of minutes at the end for closing words, but you'd like to take three minutes. I'm sure you'd love to answer this question from Aaron about, is it a, something specific about low pressure engines? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. The, the low pressure DF engine is, has come under pressure due to the methane slip, of course, um, because methane is, is known as having a global warming potential, which is considerably higher than CO2. However, um, already the step from uh, medium speed to slow speed engine uh, reduced that methane slip considerably. And now with introducing new technology can be further reduced. And of course it has a high uh, research technology focus to further reduce that. So um, DNVGL was recently stating that actually methane slip uh, related to, to the, the combustion engine is, is in the near future no longer an issue and that's not a statement made for me that's uh, in one of the presentations DNVGL was, was giving and I think it nails it to the point I mean again we have to address gases that have the potential for global warming and, and uh, there are many different species and, and to focus on one or another is wrong. We have to look at the total picture, make the total, uh, the total emission balance, toxic emission. At the moment, nobody is talking about NOx. NOx has the potential to kill people and forests and plants and so on. But uh, this is less an issue than the global warming. I, I say it, it's not worse or bad. It's just we need to look at the whole picture and find a viable solution, business viable for the solution for the industry. And there, we as, as WinGT, we can only offer our expertise and our uh, capacities to research and come up with proposals or supporting proposals from others in a way that we have a good future, which uh, at, at the end sa saves our plan. And I mean, everybody is interested to do that. And, and uh, that's a clear target here. I think he's specifically asking, is methane slip something connected to low pressure engines? Because I think it used to be, but it's not anymore. I don't know if you... <laughs> yeah, but what's the question? Um, it's the obstacle, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, that's, why, that's why That's why. I, I said, please. Uh, okay, as Dominic explained, there is, there is a cycle and thermodynamic uh, 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 reasons for it, but uh, compare the engine room with the engine room. And then you see the result. That's the yeah. simple answer to that question. And there is another methane. Methane is, uh, is a natural gas. Uh, biomethane is, is existing in the atmosphere for decades uh, from, from agriculture, from crops, and so on. Um, and and these uh, emissions are, are actually considerably higher than the emissions from, from uh, transportation. So we also have to put, a bit, uh, to put it a bit in rational. Nevertheless, again, we are focusing on it. Um, it's important that we become sustainable also with our industry and we see ourselves as a part to achieve this target. So if you have very nice closing words and I maybe if you if you want to reduce methane slip then uh, eliminate uh, next weekend uh, the T-bone steak and um, then we reduce the methane slip on, 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 on meat production. And... Um, <laughs> As Dominic said, put it in perspective. Um, I don't know. The first LNG drill was done, a wave was done in 1800 something, from a guy called Church, and uh, they they didn't really uh, make money out of it, so they just walked away. And that uh, that hole is still is, uh, somehow emitting CH4, and there are somehow millions of those uh, of those holes in the earth and emitting emitting CH4, um, unfortunately. Uh, but that's also something to put into perspective. But as you said, Dominic, we are working on it. We are working now with XTF 2.0 on it. We're not stopping here. We said that we're not resting. We're also going in the direction of further reduction and uh, further optimization. 
And all this data is available um, on our homepage in the GTD, it's called the General Technical Data. And uh, the methane emissions are already are also included in our consumption figures, performance figures. And uh, that, having said that, is methane emissions for us is a, is, a, is a must to tackle because it's going into the consumption figures. So we want to reduce the consumption figure as well. So that means emissions and, com and consumption figures we will reduce and therefore we will reduce also the CH4 emissions. Well, I'd just like to hand to Vida for half a minute of closing words. <laughs> Thank you, Dominic and, Dominic and uh, Volkmar, also Vindig for sponsoring this uh, video. Uh, we are grateful for everyone who decided to spend this one hour with VPO Global uh, webinar, and we hope that you learned something new, what engine design has to do with uh, vessel performance and uh, the greener future of maritime industry. Uh, we hope you, you will come back here next uh, week uh, on Tuesday. We will be, we will be talking about uh, how to select uh, your satellite uh, provider. Uh, thank you very much. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye.